way they're facing it, sir. Look. Hello, I'm Randy Bros, my owner at Caramat Lumin This Ways, and usually the producer and the guy behind the film on camera on these uh, videos that we have produced. We're here to do an inland interview for it's Morris Kohansky on his life. He's uh, 71 years of age now. And uh, so, Morris, uh, you've been uh, around this for quite some time. And uh, bushcraft survival, modern survival, wilderness living, is there a difference? Yes, there, there, you can define everything into separate groupings. Uh, the, you can mix everything together and then many years later you have a substantial body of knowledge, but sometimes uh, you have to isolate out. Uh, like for example, I call modern survival is the knowledge that uh, modern pilots and people who wander around the bush, they don't necessarily want to become primitive uh, skill uh, uh, activists and so on. They just want to know how to get by if they land in the bush. So that's, I, I call that modern survival. And then of course the, the sort of wilderness skills and so on you present to kids in elementary school, I think it's quite a bit different from what the normal bushcrafter is looking for. You know, the young man or old man, whatever, people in their late 20s who are self-sufficient and they take up um, survival and bushcraft as a hobby. Generally, in my way of, uh, of seeing things, uh, people would take survival courses, but they weren't sure uh, exactly what they were after. They thought that weaving a basket, perhaps lighting fire by friction, making an arrowhead, that was to do with modern survival. But I would say that modern survival is quite a bit different. It uses all the most modern uh, compact things to help you get by. And it's for the person who is not really interested that much in anything but being able to uh, get by uh, when, uh, when they have a problem. Whereas on the other hand, there are people that are working towards self-sufficiency, working towards living like a, an Aboriginal person uh, uh, 2,000 years ago. And that's kind of a hobby and it's kind of a valid objective. And then there are people all in between. They like to have a comfortable tent. They also like to know how to be able to use tools and knives and, and understand many of these things. And a lot of people start sometimes with rather um, um, modern advanced things like titanium stoves or, or the, the best design in axis. And gradually as time goes by, they often uh, get withdraw from these things, but they start with the good things and as their skill develops, they go to simpler and simpler things. And then they find that all they know, have uh, or need is their knowledge plus the resources that Mother Nature provides without having to bring very much. So it sounds like you've uh, uh, um, instructed a lot of people in this uh, business. How long have you been doing this here and what type of groups have you instructed? Well, I think I started back in 19... Um, 67 or 68 in there somewhere where I was working weekends. I was regularly employed five days of the week and then I would uh, spend my weekends and when I got 14, 15 consecutive weekends that I worked my wife told me to make up my mind whether I was going to stay in one job or another uh, and I think in 1971 I quit essentially a regular job and took up what I call freelancing which means that rather than having one employer or two, if you work maybe weekends or moonlight, uh, I had 52 employers, almost a different employer every weekend. So who, who did you learn a lot of this stuff from? Who are, like, who are your mentors? Well, first of all, I, uh, I was fortunate that I, uh, I was interested in libraries. As an outdoor person, I probably, uh, in my day, read more. Outdoor people are quite visual and they don't really read a lot. Uh, and then I began meeting people along the line that uh, I found seemed to be saying things I couldn't find in the books. Uh, well, first of all, I come back from a, a heritage. My parents were forest people, you might say. They came, when they came to Canada, they knew how to subsist on, you know, um, jackrabbits and grouse and mushrooms and berries and then hunt your moose and deer and fish a lot. Uh, and so I learned certain things from my parents. And then it came that in the uh, 
area of specialization, probably the biggest influence was Tom Roycroft. And he was the one that I discovered was the man who became my guru and still is. He's 12 years younger. Uh, I'm 12 years younger than he is. Uh, probably the next person you might say that played a big role was uh, Dr. Harvey Scott, because he's the one that uh, saw fit to incorporate me and make a professor out of me, you might say, although I don't really throw that term around, but for I think 23, 24 years, I taught at the university level right at the time when outdoor education was uh, uh, the hottest item going. And they found that I was the person who knew how to light fires and sharpen axes and use them and knives and everything. Whereas the general outdoor ed type uh, uh, programs started as uh, meeting the needs of counselors in summer camps, you know, canoeing, canoeing instruction, orienteering and all that. So they saw fit to incorporate me in that I had enough background by then, by the time Harvey Scott met me. And so through him, I was able to work at the university level, which really eased the, the income situation because it was very regular work for about 20, almost 25 years. Now it it's, does not exist in, as far as I can tell in, in Edmonton where, where I worked before because everything went to Calgary. But basically, Harvey Scott, well then along the line there were people like uh, um, uh, Patrick O'Reilly uh, involved in the outdoor programs in Dawson Creek. He kept hiring me on very extended, uh, like virtually mid-April till the end of June. And the pay was so good that finally I was living in a much more comfortable level of existence than what I got from the pay I derived from the university. Except the university, I had unlimited borrowing uh, privileges as far as the library is concerned. And then probably fourth down the line, there probably is a dozen more people I could list, but it would be Karamat, which persists in making sure that uh, a lot of the stuff that I know gets out there to the public through the medium of the internet and, and whatever. The uh, grunt work when it comes to the booklets that uh, Lori and Randy in their, in their, in their uh, scheme of things are incorporating uh, my expertise and contributing their, their uh, uh, technical and financial backing. So without uh, 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 Randy and Lori, I probably would be sitting at home basically trying to write another book or whatever rather than expanding into the uh, field of view. Another person I could mention is the publisher, the original publisher uh, of uh, Lone Pine, uh, Kennedy, the old man, when he was around, he was the one that approached me through other friends, that mutual friends, and asked me if I knew how to write a book of a certain kind, which was based on Bushcraft, on uh, Grace Bushcraft. And I, being familiar with it, I committed, and I think that book has done a great deal to either my reputation, for my reputation, or my my whatever, in that without him, maybe of all I know, I would have not have published a, a hardcover book even yet because I am so slow in that regard. Now, now you, you mentioned Tom Roycroft at the start there. Can you expand a little bit more about him, of how you met him and uh, what his role in this was? Well, uh, from even high school days, I was collecting information and whatever books that were available that came to my attention that might be at the local public library in Prince Albert, uh, and, and, you know, things like that. And so I, I had a small library where I had become fairly familiar. And I had decided somewhere in high school that I wanted to become a writer. And then eventually I decided that the writing would be hands-on stuff, similar to what you find in good boy scout manuals. Well, uh, so here uh, I am working away, gathering material, to be able to become a writer in this field. You know, I studied Kephart, I studied uh, uh, Dan Beard, I studied all these people, and I said, well, what kind of a book could I come out that sort of incorporated the, uh, the sustainability and the longevity of these publications? Well, as I'm doing all this uh, in my line of work as a welfare officer, I ended up getting posted to where Tom Roycroft lived, and he lived in Hinton, and near Hinton was the uh, old RCAF survival training field detachment. Um, the people taking survival courses in the RCAF 
generally went north of Edmonton to Nemeo. They did all their classroom work there. And then for their practical experience, they went to Hinton. And there, uh, uh, Tom and a handful of other civilian instructors were the people that did all the laboring work and the preparation. And they were the steady type of people that the military maintained. And the military instructors and so on came and went so frequently that they didn't have a, uh, you know, they, they'd teach and when they got good, they were posted to somewhere else. But the civilian survival instructors, they uh, were old, usually veteran trappers, experienced people, and they were around and they assisted or performed the role of keeping continuity going there. Well, when I uh, became a welfare officer, I drove by the front of the survival school and there was the signs, and at first it said Department of National Defense Survival School. And then it had many signs, uh, no trespassing, trespassers would be proud. I was too intimidated to drive in because I got very curious, because until I saw a survival training school, I never thought that there were people who, you know, school means instructors, people who teach the subject. And that, uh, that had never occurred to me as, as part of my, my insight into, uh, the you know learning about survival and uh, outdoor skills, and one day uh, uh, after a number of months, I see this person downtown, and he looks like he's wearing a military uniform, but there's no markings on it except a civilian instructor on the epaulet. So I stopped him on the street, and I said, "Hey, do you work at that survival school?" And that was Tom Warcroft. So there we we talked on that street corner. I think hours. But I figured so we'd be four to five hours. And then from then on, I became his understudy because he was starved to talk to anybody that knew anything about the out of doors in that sense. And uh, his co-instructors, to them, it was sort of a, you know, a nine to five job. They weren't really keen on doing things. Well, one of the first things Tom asked me, he says, do you know how to light fire other than with matches? Do you know how to use a bow drill? Do you know how to use flint and steel? And I had to admit that I didn't, although I said I most certainly have the literature on the subject. And so the two of us began working at these, these um, type of problems. And it got a little competitive because we tried to outdo each other whenever we made any progress. And we advanced fairly quickly and we could not find anyone to show us. Uh, we had to help each other to learn things like bow drilling. Generally, if we asked anybody say, who might be potentially able to light fire with bow drill, we would say, do you know how to light fire with bow drill? And they say, oh yes, I know how to light fire with bow drill. And then you find out they read about it, but they didn't have, they didn't ever actually do it. So we, we just couldn't find it. Even Encyclopedia Britannica was a rather a poor source for helping us to light fire by friction. But anyway, one thing led to another and we began to look into these subjects. And one of the subjects after uh, lighting fire in various ways was the plants because we somehow felt that they were the raw materials uh, that the sur person who's engaged in survival uh, will find greater benefit if they know something about them. And so we set it up to start learning the plants and between the two of us, we were able to accelerate uh, the situation. Well, it didn't hurt uh, that an outdoor education center near, near the survival school uh, opened up. And we found that if we wanted to learn the plants, all we had to do is tell them we could run a plant course and then pick the brains of the students. Because <laughs> generally, if you have 20 students that come and take a plant course, uh, the plant you're looking at that you don't know, one of the students knows it. So it was a very quick way to be able to get it identified. And then one thing led to another, and eventually you couldn't find a plant you didn't know. And, and then you realize that to the ancient Aboriginal way of life, uh, they had a very uh, extensive and intimate knowledge of the resource that grew at their feet. And the funny thing is when I'd go to the anthropology department, oh, they were good at rocks and flints and, and uh, a lot of that stuff, but they knew very little about plants. They were very scanty because uh, that is perishable archaeology. And so a lot of these people I started to relate to were quite fascinated with the fact that this is how snare cord is made and and whatever, I would relate to them trying to find out more on how to make arrowheads at a quartzite. And they weren't really even very good at that. They imported their stones, their rocks from other places. And I persisted in saying, well, their quartzite is what I find all the time. I want to learn how to use it. And eventually sort of became a master of the quartzite.